Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. One of the few upsides of a summer of extreme weather events is that almost no one still doubts that the Earth's climate is rapidly changing. Of course, that's also the bad news. Climate change is accelerating with devastating impacts everywhere. But nowhere is warming faster than the Arctic, and the consequences could be awful if melting glaciers and potential methane releases trigger tipping points in global systems. What is the reality on the ground in the far north? How fast are conditions changing? And more importantly, what can be done to mitigate uh, or adapt to rapid change? What can the rest of us learn from those efforts? My guest today is Taro Mustonen, a scholar of Arctic biodiversity and climate, a leader of the Snow Change Cooperative that works with indigenous people and climate issues throughout the Arctic, and currently the head of his town of Selkie in North Karelia, Finland. Welcome, Taro. Thank you, Alan. I'd like to start with a personal question to scale the reality of the changing climate. You spend a lot of time in Finland's forests and on the waters. Indeed, I think you started as a fisherman before you did your doctorate. What are the biggest differences you have experienced now compared to when you were young? Well, I'm now 45 years old, so I'm one of those fortunate people that were able to witness and experience our winters here in Borel in the Boreal Finland back in 1980s. And uh, both the older fishermen and I myself also remember very explicitly the winter of 1987 and 86, when we still had minus 35, 40 degree uh, long lasting cold spells in January, February. And you could almost argue that the seasons were in place. You could predict certain uh, stability. Spring will come at a certain time at the end of April, autumn will commence in September, and winter sets in at the sort of mid-November to December. And now, given all that's going haywire, those are, of course, nice memories of a much more stable climate. Your academic work focused on Finnish traditional knowledge in relation to water. And as as I've gotten to know you a little bit, at least through the web, One of the continuing themes of your work seems to be an effort to blend traditional knowledge, ancient observations with academic research. What can academics learn from the indigenous peoples? And are they willing to? (laughs) Well, that's a very good question. Um, Or actually, actually, it's kind of two sets of questions. Can they and are they doing it? Um, What can academics learn from these knowledge systems that can date back hundreds of years? or in the case of, for example, indigenous Australians, uh, tens of thousands of years, is a set of values. And those cultures that have long-lasting connections with their ecosystems, with their home areas, and first and foremost, memories of these um, places, can convey at their best very profound understanding of how change looks like, what are the drivers of change, and ultimately, what are the solutions? Because, of course, in, if we think of scientific knowledge, you don't find scientific data on temperatures or uh, weather events often dating back more than uh, a century or 50 years. And therefore, the engagement with the indigenous or traditional knowledge in different parts of the world, if you do it well and in a kind of a respectful way, may yield completely different drivers of change and important context. But the other side of the coin, which is the fact that is science listening, is equally uh, on the table. And um, we also have to acknowledge the power position that science has. Because the, the way research and science has been put into the context over the past 400 years has become the dominant way of understanding ecosystems or, in fact, the whole universe and the world. And 
in order to try to come to a place where those two systems of way, ways of knowing would have a dialogue requires acts of being humble and of course acts of being able to listen and when you have very strong power narratives of how things are uh, it takes a long time and very special individuals within science to have those skills to come to a place of understanding and and uh, realization of what what the capacity and potential of engaging with traditional knowledge could be so it's it's almost like a individual journey on the researcher level and then as a collective effort when we discuss traditional knowledge and its relations with science it's also a very profound conversation on what happened over the past three, four hundred years. We shouldn't forget that a lot of these knowledge systems that are now revered or cherished were under attack and under attack and concentrated um, nullification by the state, by the church, by the power society back in the day. So that that's kind of a and in many ways they were also declared illegal. So now we have a very wonderful, I guess you could say, a moment in time when we can have profound dialogues, but, but you still need to um, understand and come to a place of uh, listening in order to start to see the wider picture. And to be specific about climate change, are there things that that knowledge, that um, indigenous knowledge can bring to the climate change conversation that might change not just how we understand, but what we do. Because clearly we're at a moment where uh, we, we have a pretty good understanding of the problem. Uh, we aren't doing so well on the solutions. <laughs> to, be well, Alan, to be diplomatic. Well, Alan, that's well put. Um, yeah, well, it's, it starts from the basic facts of where we are today. And one of the realizations that not many people know is that if you think all across the globe, about 80% of world's remaining biodiversity, meaning natural systems that are still functioning to a certain extent, can be found on indigenous and traditional community lands. So that's in some ways the metrics and the best possible evidence that something is going on in terms of what they are doing that is worthwhile investigating and having a uh, respectful dialogue with. Now, what are the solutions that indigenous peoples, for example, or traditional knowledge could offer to the world come in many forms? But it's not magic. It's not some kind of a Star Wars force that comes and emanates and suddenly everybody will be singing around the campfire and we are saved. What can we, for example, do regarding radioactivity? or highly acidic waters, there's not much that indigenous peoples um, can do except to observe and inform and, and, of course, recount the further damages that may have taken place if there was pollution or something else. So when I think of that in terms of uh, climate change, I think the whole, perhaps the most profound things we could try to investigate and and learn from regarding indigenous peoples and their um, long-lasting engagement with the planet is the realization of the sentient landscapes. What we consider to be empty spaces, things that we can zone or decide on or clear-cut or make a new highway on, are often perceived from the indigenous viewpoint to be, for the lack of a better term, uh, sentient landscapes. And if that's true, or even if we take it just as a polite fact that it's their cultural interpretations. It's still a checks and balances mechanism for not doing harm or having a precautionary principle. The second or the last thing I would add here may be that many of the, um, if you then really engage with indigenous communities and they also engage with you, that's part of the, obviously a dialogue, uh, some of the elders, some of the knowledge holders can provide us with profound leadership capacity because they may possess knowledges and views and, for the lack of a better term, vision for how could we come to a much better place. But the root cause of our crisis in climate change often, as I have heard it 
is not really about the technologies or the economy or the uh, this and that carbon reductions. It's the crisis that we have as global society and the loss of knowledge of understanding what nature is. That that's how the root cause of of the cancer, in a way, started, and and that's probably where the indigenous knowledge holders could guide us in terms of keeping safe spaces, creating solutions, and providing morals and ethics on better treatment of ecosystems, landscapes, and the non-human beings that still occupy this planet with us before it's too late. Let me use that to segue to the work of Snow Change. Uh, you, Snow Change, are advocates and, and even better practitioners of rewilding. Um, along with other European organizations, you guys have restored and recovered already substantial damaged landscapes, buying and transforming, in particular, former peak production sites. What is, briefly, what is the science behind rewilding and what are the possibilities? Yeah. Well, we want to call it often northern rewilding in the sense that the kind of societies that exist in the Arctic and in the boreal are also peoples that have, for the lack of better term, uh, retained ways of life, for example, fisheries, hunting systems, and gathering economies, reindeer herding, and whatever the case, that are very ancient. There are practices here and uh, knowledge that can be combined with science to restore and, as you said, provide for large-scale and landscape-wide rewilding. The logic behind our work, for example, here, and this take on rewilding, this specific way of doing it, has to do with the fact that no more land is being made, or maybe in China or some Hong Kong, they are creating artificial islands. But the, the fact remains that on this planet, there's not a single hectare being or acre being made anymore. And now that we are so deep into this crisis, it's obvious that we have to conserve and maintain those core ecosystems that are still functioning, delivering and offering us climate security. And however, the vast potential, especially in the boreal forests and peatlands on climate change action comes then into play. And what I mean by that is that uh, not all people know that one third of world's soil-based carbon is located in the Arctic and in the boreal peatlands and forests. And many of those sites are degraded. They have been utilized by humans for peat mining, for forestry, for ditching, or whatever the cause might have been back in the day. Now, we have come up, we have come up with a way of combining uh, traditional knowledge and the latest science to move fast on over landscapes and rewild them. And what that actually implies in practice is that sometimes, depending on the site, you always have to look at the actual site. Um, we may have to have an early human intervention. So if, it, if it's a moonscape, there, there's nothing in the ecosystem. We may have to use caterpillars, stickers, and things like that to create, for example, wetlands that can then instigate and, and be the seed action for return of the succession of boreal peatland, the species, the birds, the sphagnum and other drivers of natural uh, processes on those sites. But there's a point in time, and we of course hope always that this point is as early as we can when we let go. And the notion of rewilding is to really trust nature and her guidance on who comes back, in what order and how. And the, the, uh, in, in short, the action on rewilding here in the north, in the boreal peatland, especially, um, matters for the whole planet in two ways. One, we are recreating huge carbon sinks and saving a lot of carbon on the ground. So, for example, on, on a 100 hectare site, we might be able to stop over 1 million kilos of CO2 from being emitted to the atmosphere a year. These are not trifle numbers. And secondly, because so many of the birds of the world come here, to nest in the summertime, we are able to create safe havens for biodiversity that are then again part of the huge northern wonderful puzzle of how nature functions. And ult ultimately, these become also equity sites where our communities that have faced large-scale 
natural extraction by the state, for example, um, we are now healing and restoring these, rewilding these lands and creating jobs, creating well-being. And many people are feeling proud of the fact that their traditional knowledge, their commitment to restoration of habitats is taken seriously. What is the potential for rewilding? Rewilding, to quote Sir David Attenborough, is probably our only chance globally to maintain biodiversity. And it, the logic behind that is that we need to s- secure even the damaged lands back for nature. If, you, if we think globally, the trouble starts with the pollinators, loss of wetlands, the, and the change of ecosystem services that, that are currently collapsing worldwide. And that's why by even a degraded site that looks on the surface as a lost land or polluted area or something like that, may contain seeds of a vast solution space if we start rewilding in scale. I'll give you an example from the U.S. If you think of the big, important today's important pro- production fields in agriculture, they unfortunately still follow these kind of linear patterns of how we produce maize or, or hay or whatever uh, grains out there in the Midwest. Uh, rewilding could be coming in and saying to the farmers and to the people, you will earn better money and we will try to make this work better on your lands if you allow more, um, for example, natural succession happening, wetlands here and there, trapping of carbon dioxide using more natural style landscapes and so on and so on. It's it's not to, uh, actually against anybody. You can rewild pretty much from New York City to um Greenland, if you know what you are doing. The only place probably where you can't do much is Antarctica uh, because of the still ice that hopefully stays there. But the, the potential for rewilding matters on global scale. And as I said before, it can't replace the realization that we need to preserve those core areas, Amazonia, the tundra, Alaska, and so on and so on. But it can be a very powerful and fast mechanism to come to a place to suck more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere by recreating natural carbon sinks and, and uh, sites and give what we, I think, need first and foremost, space and time for species to function. Because without the pollinators, we won't be here for too long either. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org slash donate. Let me segue to the IPCC, COP, and politics. Um, You were... Uh, lead, you served as a lead author during the current IPCC. Uh, I would argue that past assessments have, if anything, been too cautious, but at least they contributed, very importantly, to forcing politicians to begin to deal with the science uh, of climate change. What is the role now of the IPCC as we head towards COP26 in a few weeks? Alan, that's a very timely question. I have spent today all of today, uh, with my colleagues drafting the summary for the policymakers. And of course, we are (laughs) exactly on this question now. Uh, However, IPCC operates within the world of science. It's the most important science process of what world's countries know about climate change. Um, It has been criticized in the past for being too conservative, too slow, and it comes out every seven years or five years with different reports. There's some um, advantages also to the fact that we take a couple of years to take stock of what science has been saying. And even a single paper actually doesn't matter too much. In order to come to a scientific consensus on a big issue like climate change or how, how big and vast the changes are or what's driving them, we need proper evidence. And that's why some of the IPCC will matter in in, uh, COP in uh, Scotland over the next few weeks and and next month because of the fact that, in a way, it's our evidence base. Now the government, and it is the very first COP and the report that's coming out now and came out in August, that's post 
Paris Climate Treaty. And for most part of the world's countries that are part of the Paris UN Agreement on Climate Change, uh, that that will be then like a checks and balances moment when when the uh, evidence is in place and they have to come to a, a agreement on what will we do on 1.5 or whatever the case. So in that sense, lifetimes have been spent and people have taken extraordinary measures in the world of science to in the middle of COVID to try to fight for the best possible report we can. But I'm the first person also to admit that the IPCC also needs reformative steps. We need to engage, for example, with indigenous knowledge, with vulnerable groups. Um, and given the last thing that happened this summer over there in the U, uh, sorry, in the North American context was, of course, California and uh, British Columbia with the temperatures of 49.6 that nobody could foresee on this scale. And also the, the same kind of temperatures all across um, other parts of global south, uh, huge fires in Siberia and so on and so on. So one of the things that uh, we have to bear in mind is that IPCC is only what it is. It's a scientific summary of what we know, but it doesn't respond to day to day and it can't advocate for um, sudden shifts like the one we saw in Lytton, BC with 49.6 temperature in Celsius. And that's why the, it falls back to civil society, politicians, and, and these leaders to realize where we are. I think they have ample evidence now, but that's what I have also <laughs> said and felt for the past 30 years uh, in previous rounds as well. And, uh, of course, I'm not a, too optimistic of getting a breakthrough there, but at least we have done all that we could within the IPCC. It's not a question of optimism or pessimism. It is a question of reality. Politicians in most countries, um, but certainly in too many countries, have been afraid to be honest with their citizens about where we are. That's the role the IPCC has played and what needs to be done. But I'm curious as, as a player in this, in this game, and I, I use the word game with big air quotes on it. Do you think the real action that will matter is going to come from the top down or come from agents like, like Snow Change, like other organizations that are actually doing stuff as opposed to uh, politicians who are, who are in most cases subject to election every now and then, who are afraid to take dramatic action? If we're going to bend the arc of the changing climate, are the actors who bend it going to be those who are actually doing things or are they going to be political leaders? And Well, this is, of course, the most profound question of our time. It's also the most profound uh, issue of our lifetime in the North and in the, uh, around the world. Um, my personal opinion is that, uh, which, of course, doesn't advocate the IPCC position, but just personally, is that... Uh, um, most of the governments will fail and most of the governments will be able to do something too late. That's why the emergency services and especially uh, military will have a role to play in large evacuation actions, uh, rebuilding cities, recreating refugee camps. And probably it's only, unfortunately, the military systems that will ultimately be on hand when a lot of these horrible things will happen. And there's not much that we rely on in terms of the governments. Um, however, the governments are the only thing we have. So it's, it's also a debate on how, how much and to what extent we can maintain this, this particular kind of political order, financial order, security order in the world. And as long as we don't explore the, the uh, unhealthy, and often it has been said they are also greedy, uh, fundamentals of our global market system, for example, it is very unlikely that these kind of governments are able to function in time to save us from the worst, even though we, are, of course, try to supply them with the information every day. So therefore, the agency of change or what will work rests often with organizations that are having far longer vision of action beyond election cycles and commitment to their, for example, in our case, to our home communities and landscapes. Um, I mean, I personally started this work 21 years ago, and 
it's only by witnessing the physical comebacks of species, uh, cleaner waters, and uh, the feeling and engagement with our rewilded sites and cons- conservation sites that the hope starts to emerge. And ultimately, what we are discussing is a sense of reality. The machinery, the political realm, and the global society has uh, a set view on reality. That's that's been fu- uh, funded and, and created by certain interest groups. Reality rests elsewhere. And organizations like ours that or others that are doing this are often facing the world as it really happens, the good and the bad, and uh, the, the kind of real-world evidence that happens, whether it's Inuit whalers out in Alaska witnessing permafrost melt events or tsunami happening in uh, Thailand. or um, And what I'm trying to say here is that there's a gap. How do we address that gap? The only way to address that gap is through two actions. Knowledge. So we have to communicate much better where we are and how bad things are and, and try to inform and get more resources to this kind of work that actually does something and physically transforms landscapes back into health. And secondly, human societies are not led with intelligence, money, science, or um, market forces. Humans are often, and they should be led, in our opinion, with the spiritual guidance. And I don't use that word lightly. I'm referring here to all of our spiritual traditions that have the same kind of a um, core message, which is that humans can have a good life. We are not the enemy of nature. We are not here to conquer, destroy, or pillage our home. And that's, in a way, the gap. That's how we cross the gap. That's how we cross the desert. How we do that in practice rests then on all of our societies to come to a new place. And my fear is that we will not come to that place before massive disruptive change happens. And a lot of these interests that are driving our sense of reality today have to go. It's not, never too late, but it, it will be later in the game, so to speak, if you refer to the game. And we are not there yet. We are still pretending that we have the luxury of this and that. We have the luxury of deciding on 1.5 or 2. Point that or 3.5. None of that really matters. Change is so big underway now, or this kind of changes in the oceans, for example, the way species are moving further north, deeper, the way uh, forests are behaving, and all, all, all these actions which are um, something we will not be able to stop are reshaping our planet already. And that's why the only thing that matters today, today in my mind is the gap and how do we cross that gap. We can do it in an orderly fashion with the minimal number of casualties, with the minimum number of damages and minimum number of um, people harmed. Or we can do what humanity often does, which is the train full speed to the wall and then we count the dead and pick up where we can. But we, we are in a nexus of a very profound moment on the planet. And um, I'm not too interested in actually, I get to meet with the governments and prime ministers and so on, but the, the real action is really always on the boots with the crown or boots on the ground and restoring every single acre and hectare. Because more we can do that, we can rely that there's a fighting chance for natural systems to continue to operate. And humans are nothing if those systems are not functioning. Do you think, and I use the word ordinary with humility and quotes, ordinary people understand or are beginning to understand what you just said? And again, I'm less interested in what presidents or prime ministers think than I, because they'll think and do or not do. But it really is at the end of the day about whether people begin to change attitudes, values, and ultimately act. Are you seeing that? You you have a unique position because you deal both with the highest and with the most ordinary. Are people starting to get it, do you think? Well, the most profound and progressive peoples with the best knowledge are often the most poor and the ones that are there out in the ocean, for example, fishing. What comes to mind is a fishing community called Libela, 
in South Africa where we formed direct links uh, some years ago. They probably earn nothing and they still try to maintain their way of life, their culture. It's a Zulu community and we have been exchanging with them on fishing techniques. How, how do you make a good net? How do you choose your fishing spots? How do you build up your traditional knowledge despite the huge uh, geographical distance on uh, that we have? We have so much in common with the traditional fishers of Nibela in South Africa. And... Uh, the understanding that I have from all of my travels or all of our teams that operate around the world and my colleagues is that um, the so-called ordinary people are uh, very much on board. They are very much aware of where we have to go. They are having also memory. And this memory has to do with the past of what happened. All those wars, all those colonial actions, all those 1970s, 1940s, 1800s. And of course, the present is the sum of all that happened in the past. That's why the political machinery often doesn't want to hear about the past, or at least in the way that it would be narrated by the people that really experienced the impacts. That's why the hope and the understanding of what climate change implies, I think, it is shared by a majority, I wouldn't argue that all people will understand or care about the urgency or, or how bad things are actually right now. I think a lot of people are also surviving in a post-COVID and middle of COVID situation. I spoke earlier today to Alaska, to one of our Inuit partner villages, and they are heading to another lockdown because so many people are not taking the vaccine and they are believing in, in those kind of uh, stupid news that uh, alter the truth. But the point is that any person living uh, under these, what I said earlier about the sense of reality that's really built on living uh, on the ground with the nature or in a city uh, and, and you live your normal life, are probably the people that will support most climate change actions because they understand that there's something to fight for. Life matters. It's not about the money. It's about the beautiful way of growing up as a human being, a woman or a man, and realizing your, your pathway uh, through life. And uh, it's what, worth fighting for and also experiencing nature, the birds, pollinators, trees, fish, and all the other things out there. So the, uh, it's really about the gap. And the gap has never been solved. I don't think it has. we have never found a country or a place that has come to a place with the exception perhaps of South Africa with the Truth Commission and, and Mandela. And the difficulty is that to, to come, try to summarize an e extremely complex conversation or question is that where are the Mandelas of this century? Where are they? We don't have those kind of country figures or Mandelas or others that would be able to convey in ways that people listen to and understand. The ordinary person would be able to listen to and say, yes, I understand, I support this, and this is where we have to go in order to survive. We don't have that kind of leadership today, exactly because of those ways of why politics doesn't work and on and on and on. And I think this is therefore uh, reinforcing the gap. And I don't have a good solution on how, how to... Uh, bridge that gap for, for anything else except to do the work that, for example, my colleagues and others are doing, which I think matters the most, which is to save the ecosystems and where we can rebuild them uh, and not to repeat the mistakes of the past. But it's also a very profound um, position because you see the past, you see the power, you see the mistakes that happened, you see the wars and all the things that we can learn from. And then you look to the beautiful future. It will be a new planet, but it's still our home. And there's so much to do. There's so much to rebuild, so many opportunities to heal the land, the people, the communities. Uh, we have, for example, indigenous Australian team that's rebuilding the fire management for their country to prevent the huge kind of big fires that destroyed Australia two years ago. And it's all built on 40,000 years of knowledge. And these are the years for the first time in a century when they are able to do that. So it's also a very beautiful and profound moment in time for our communities to rebuild, 
and work towards solutions. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think the real point is not just mind the gap, but we've got to close that gap. And with the work <laughs> that you're doing, others are doing, that that's possible. Um, it's, it's necessary for sure. Whether it's possible, I guess we leave to others to decide in the future. So thank you very much. Um, I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Alan. All the best. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. <laughs>